Okay, Lyme disease classically is an infection that is due to an organism that's called Borrelia burgdorferi, which is a corkscrew type of bacteria that can cause infection disease. It very often is associated with other infections. Uh, two examples that I have before you are an organism by the name of Bordinella and an organism by the name of Babesia. And they can all potentially be active in one individual contributing to that individual's illness. Now they are a part of what we characterize as tick-borne diseases. And what that means is they are carried by a tick. And in this particular instance, it's called the deer tick. Uh, the black-legged deer tick, or Ixodes scapularis, is the Latin term, which you can see is quite small. And this uh, photograph uh, represents uh, the three stages of the tick. Uh, the very smallest on the far right is the larva. The next one to the left of that is the nymph. And then the two adults the adult male, and then the far left is the adult female. And you can see in the real photograph on a, a, a digit, on a finger, that, that even the adult is very small, and it's the nymph, which is a quarter the size of that, that actually is the one that generally infects people more than any others. And as we can see, this is downloaded from the CDC website. The areas in blue represent reported cases to the CDC with a couple of qualifiers. One is that the CDC states that they probably underrepresent their, uh, this uh, diagram by up to at least the power of 10, so that the number of reported cases can potentially be multiplied by 10 to represent the actual number of real cases. And what you can see in the diagram is that Northern Virginia is on the very lowest cusp of that very strong solid blue area uh, that is migrating, that I don't have here, but it is migrating south, uh, but represents uh, the uh, mid-Atlantic, northeastern seaboard up into the lower tip of Maine. And interestingly enough, Minnesota and Michigan are also hotbeds to this, and so that we are in an endemic environment, meaning that there are a large number of cases of Lyme disease in this area and moving northwards along the coast. There have been reported cases of Lyme disease contracted in every state in the nation, although some areas certainly are more likely to have that than others. Uh, locally, this is representative of Fairfax County, thanks to Jorge uh, Arias, who is the entomologist of Fairfax County. Uh, each one of those red dots represents a case of Lyme disease between the 2005-2010 time frame. And if you can uh, recognize Dulles Airport, I believe it is to the far left, so that westward is a, a larger uh, population center that has been uh, for a number of cases, and if you extrapolate it to Loudoun County, we're what's west of Fairfax County. And uh, in the next slide, assuming that it goes, here we go, um, is a bar graph representative of the number of cases reported to Fairfax County uh, in the years that are represented. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the numbers are increasing. Now, some of this could be what we call reporting error or reporting bias. And what that represents is, uh, as in the 2005 time frame, uh, the uh, patients are becoming more aware, physicians are becoming more aware, so they're looking for it, they're identifying it more. But these uh, increases go well beyond that, and we feel that there, this is a real rise in incidence. Uh, and what's, what's interesting is a study that was done by Fairfax County uh, last year, and, and that showed that virtually a quarter of those deer ticks that were uh, captured by Fairfax County had Borrelia in them. So there's one out of four chance, at least one out of four chance that there was risk of contracting Lyme disease, at least in Fairfax County, uh, by a, a, a tick bite from a deer tick, which I want to emphasize that deer ticks are one of four tick types of ticks that are in this area and uh, is the only uh, type of tick for all intents and purposes that, uh, from which you can contract this illness.
Now what I'd like to represent briefly is the life cycle of the deer ticks. So you have a sense of what these larvae and nymphs and this mean. And time of year is important because that uh, can uh, impact on your risk of contracting the illness and risk of exposure to, to ticks. Uh, it's a two-year cycle. Uh, unfortunately, my pointer doesn't project on the screen. So if you look into the center of the picture, you can see that the eggs are in the center in the spring, they are laid by the adult female, and they become larva sometime in the summer. At that point, there's no risk of contracting a lime from a bite of a larva because they're not infected. However, they do what's called a blood meal and, and uh, take a, a bite of a small animal, such as a white-footed mouse or uh, a bird, and if that animal has a reservoir uh, has Borrelia lyme and or other tick-borne illnesses in its bloodstream, then that larva will then have the potential of uh, then passing that uh, potential infection to, to a human host. But the larva then ultimately becomes a nymph the following year, which is the next stage. And it's during the nymph stage, in the late spring and early summer, when the nymph is growing uh, more rapidly and looks more aggressively for its blood meal. It's during this time of year that it, an individual is more likely to be exposed to and potentially contract Lyme disease. And in fact, in data that's shown by Fairfax County, um, the, the blue is 2009, the red is 2010, is a slight difference, but basically what you can tell, each of the numbers on the bottom represent which month of the year, so January 1, December 12. You can see in the middle, so sometime between May and August is the peak of incidents of contracting Lyme, of reporting of Lyme disease. So if you think back a month or so prior is when that exposure would most likely have been. And in terms of presentation, certainly people have heard of the rash associated with Lyme disease. There is a classic rash called erythema migrans that classically has a bullseye like this picture. But I have to emphasize, not everybody with exposure to a tick is going to develop this. And unfortunately, the literature is confusing in this respect because many of the studies, original studies, were done by inclusion. You had to have a rash in order to be included in the study. So that much of the literature suggests that you have 80% uh, or some odd number of people who get a tick bite are going to get a rash. Well, further research has been done that perhaps less than 50% of people with a tick bite and infected with Lyme are going to develop this rash. Not only that, but the rash may be atypical. It may not quite look like this, and or it may be located in an area that an individual may not notice, behind the heel or in the hairline, so that even if you do develop the rash, you may never see it. Classically, the acute presentation of Lyme disease is a viral-like illness. So fever, headache, joint pain, fatigue, acutely may last a few days to a week or two. And it usually occurs within a few weeks of the tick bite uh, and, and exposure. And one of the recommendations that I'm trying to, to train our local physicians is that if there is a viral-like illness in the late spring, early summer, Consider it Lyme disease until proven otherwise. And you may never have had a bullseye rash, you may never have had a rash, you may never have realized you've been bitten by a tick, but it is so endemic in this area that for, from my standpoint, if you have a flu-like illness, you don't get influenza in the summer and the spring. And consider that Lyme can be treated at least a month with doxycycline equivalent. That's my recommendation and recommendation by others in the field. Um, but I also wanted to emphasize that yes, the peak is the spring and the summer, but people can be potentially infected any time of the year. And as you may recall, the slide I just showed, particularly in the 2010 data with the red, that even January, October, November have incidents of Lyme disease. Now, usually that's from an adult tick. It's not as frequent, but it can happen. 
I also want to emphasize that Lyme disease is, to, is treatable if it's detected early. Unfortunately, if it's detected late, it's more difficult to treat. It can be treated, but what I tell people is we really, under those circumstances, look for remission, meaning getting people to a healthy quality of life, but not necessarily cure when it's chronic because things can potentially recur. And I emphasize that not all ticks transmit Lyme disease. In fact, it's the near tick primarily. Okay, in terms of what can happen if we don't treat, so that you've been exposed, you have this flu-like illness, oh, I just had a little virus, and then things keep too along. Well, for, for whatever reason, this organism likes to go to the nervous system, so that many of the symptoms related to the condition are nervous system related. So pain, peripheral neuropathies, which are um, conditions where very often you have pain in the lower extremity or, or various pains in, in various locations. And one of the hallmark features of, of the condition is the atypicality. It's typically atypical, meaning it can, it can present in so many different ways. Um, headaches are another feature. Facial or bell's palsy. People with this condition look like they've had a stroke. They don't. It's, it's an abnormality to the facial nerve, the, the motor function of the facial nerve that causes paralysis on one side of the face. And that could be treated potentially, could potentially be permanent depending upon the individual. Arthritis simply means inflammation of the joint. This certainly is a potential presentation and what classically can occur, and you don't have to have inflammation, it could just be pain of the joint. And, and, and migratory component, meaning it can move from joint to joint, the knee, the elbow, and then it moves to a different joint. But as you can see in this picture, the knee can be swollen, painful, red, hot. Okay. Now, we get into this concept of chronic Lyme. What does that mean? Well, from my standpoint, it means an individual who is chronically ill from a persisting ongoing infection, whether that be from an undetected infection or from an infection that's not been adequately treated. Unfortunately, this is a controversial area, and as you'll see in the movie that follows uh, Under Our Skin, that the two major uh, players in this controversy are IDSA and MyLabs. IDSA, standing for the Infectious Disease Society of America, represents arguably the most influential organization of its kind, such that most interns who specialize in infections become members of this organization. And one would extrapolate that these are the experts in infections, so that a guideline promoted by this organization, one would think, would be valid and respected. Unfortunately, it has problems. Um, IWAS, on the other hand, is a small organization, a collective group of physicians, rheumatologists, general internists like myself, infectious disease, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists, it's just a mix because this condition that is known by the members of this organization can present itself in many ways, and I'm going to get to that in just a moment. So that IDSA feels that uh, that a course of anywhere from three to six weeks of antibiotic classic with doxycycline is enough. And that nobody needs any more than that, that's, that's adequate, that, that Lyme disease is easily diagnosed and it's easily treated. And for some reason they feel that any symptoms that may be either recurrent or persisting beyond that three to six week course of antibiotics is due to something else. They don't know what, but do something else. On the other hand, ILATS feels that, no, in fact, that persistence or recurrence of symptoms actually often represents, not always, but often represents an actual ongoing infectious process. And unfortunately, the IDSA has been shown, and I point out three references, all of which uh, were published in the last year, that Quote, this set of guidelines has had questions raised as to the quality of the evidence with which the recommendations have been generated. They are primarily based on low quality evidence derived from non-randomized studies or expert opinion. So those guidelines that are being promoted that suggest four weeks of antibiotics is enough, you don't need any more than that, actually are being held in question. Another 
good example of an area of, of contention is the diagnostic criteria that we use. So I was tested for Lyme and I was told I don't have it. Well, the problem is that the testing paradigm is what we call a two-tiered system, meaning that there's a screening test called ELISA, which the IDSA suggests should be the only screening test, and that only if that's positive do you then do this extra test, the Western blot, to confirm that in fact the original positive is really positive. Unfortunately, this paradigm is less than 50% sensitive. So that one out of two people going to their doctor with bona fide Lyme disease, the doctor feels it, the patient feels it, it's a, it's a negative test, according to that paradigm. The other comment that I wanted to make in relation to what often a myth that is promoted in the medical community is that a patient in order to be diagnosed with Lyme disease has to meet CDC criteria. What that means is there are certain classical characteristics of the testing that were set up by the CDC or Center for Disease Control in Atlanta that looks over disease management in the country that uh, unless it meets those strict criteria, that person doesn't have Lyme disease. Well, even the CDC suggests that those criteria were generated to, to promote surveillance, to follow a large population, not for the diagnosis of an individual at the point of care. Okay, now, what the next shift and the next few slides are going to be what I and others believe, and I've contributed to the science, and you'll see in a moment, the state of the art. What, is, what really is chronic Lyme or can it also include? Fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a pain syndrome such that it, it's, it actually is a neurologic condition, not a rheumatologic condition. The nervous system is abnormal. People feel pain at a lower threshold of, of uh, toxic or noxious stimulus. So that an individual, if you pinch a fibromyalgia patient, is more likely to have pain than someone who does not have fibromyalgia. Autonomic dysfunction. Many people probably have heard the term POTS. POTS stands for, and so I apologize for this, but postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. So I'm going to say that five times fast. So basically what that means is, is that when people go from a line to a standing position, their blood pressure drops and their heart rate goes up. That's not normal. And this is a common feature. Well, this is not, this is a feature that can very well be due to Lyme disease and that's been reported in the literature. Uh, and that there is an association with that condition. Unfortunately, the idea say does not necessarily include that in the guidelines. Um, potentially, Parkinson's, ALS, or Lugarix disease, which is a, uh, a muscle motor abnormality, um, multiple sclerosis, also a problem very often with ability to move or sense things. Uh, but there is literature to support uh, these conditions as well uh, that can be due to Lyme disease because they fall into a category of what we call idiopathic, or pathetic idiots, we don't know the cause. Well, in many cases, we actually do if we look for it. Um, neuropsychiatric conditions, not just due to being upset that you're ill, but actually many conditions such as depression, bipolar, panic, can be due to the infection and in the infection of the brain can be responsible to paranoia, dementia, schizophrenia, bipolar, panic, major depression, anorexia, etc. This does not mean to say that everybody in those categories has Lyme disease. However, Lyme disease is in the differential, meaning that if they have that condition, it ought to be at least considered, particularly if you're in an endemic area such as we are here. And then chronic fatigue syndrome is an area of my particular interest for which I recently published data uh, that I just wanted to mention information uh, briefly, and that is to define chronic fatigue syndrome because there is an overlap that you'll see momentarily. By definition, chronic fatigue syndrome basically means a condition where an individual has a chronically fatiguing condition that has a significant impact on their quality of life that lasts at least six months for which other causes of chronic fatigue have been ruled out. That's the bugaboo, ruled out, such as the two-tiered system for Lyme disease. We already know that's only 50% sensitive. So that there, unfortunately, is no marker for this condition per se. In 2003, I published an article on what we feel the best state of the art was in relation to chronic fatigue syndrome, and 
just to, to, to represent here illustratively that I uh, published that we felt that it was a multi-system process, meaning, for example, the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, the hormone system, all of these systems could potentially be abnormal in one individual contributing to their fatigue. So that those symptoms often involve fatigue, which involves lack of energy, uh, particularly post-exertional malaise, where you push yourself to a certain degree and then you pay for it afterwards, whereby you really didn't have the energy, you struggled, and then you could potentially be bed bound for a day or two if you really didn't have the reserves. Sleep disorders, fractured, non-restorative sleep, very common feature with chronic fatigue syndrome. Cognitive fog, very often associated with fibromyalgia, fibro fog, sometimes people call it. Hormone problems, adrenal in insufficiency or dysfunction, blood pressure problems, I already alluded to that. As I, soon after this publication, I began hearing stories about folks with chronic fatigue syndrome who were getting better with antibiotics and, and there, there was some connection with Lyme disease. And in fact, the more I looked into it, the more I felt compelled that that was in fact a reasonable association for which I've done research and generated this paradigm that you see here now, and unfortunately it is very busy, but you can see the corkscrew uh, picture represents the uh, picture of the Borrelia, uh, Babesia, and Bartonella are potential co-infections, and then it's the multi-system process. The immune system is abnormal. The nervous system is abnormal, frequently associated with fractured non restorative sleep, with, with mood disorders, with cognitive impairment, um, and then hormone and endocrine problems as well, such that um, about a month ago I published data in a peer-reviewed literature, evidence-based, that I looked at 210 patients in my practice, primarily from Northern Virginia, 210 patients met the criteria for the definition of chronic fatigue syndrome, including a negative Lyme test. I then looked for Lyme using other types of markers, other types of blood tests, and felt that 209 out of the 210 had a high likelihood actually of having zero negative Lyme disease, meaning that the blood test for Lyme disease was negative, but they actually had it. And I treated them with antibiotics and 88% had significant improvement chronic fatigue syndrome patients. So we now have evidence-based, peer-reviewed, published data to support a group of chronic fatigue patients who actually have seronegative chronic Lyme, and that published, peer-reviewed, evidence-based, that long-term antibiotics judiciously prescribed in selected patients, not anybody who walks in with chronic fatigue, it ought to be looked at carefully, but that there now is evidence-based in the peer-reviewed literature that long-term antibiotics in selected patients can improve outcomes. You'll see why I'm saying this when you watch the movie in a minute. So as I introduce this topic, I welcome you to explore what is discussed here momentarily, the different perspective of IDSA and ILADS as you watch Under Our Skins. You make the choice, and you, and you decide. Thank you.